All right, good afternoon guys, let's get started. So last class we started talking about sets and I defined what a set was and we started talking about the different things you could do to sets. So we discussed the union operation, the intersection operation, set difference, taking the complement of a set, uh, and we, we talked about this last weird one, uh, and that was taking the Cartesian product of two sets. Um, that's not too important right now, but we're going to come back to that later, so that's why I introduced it last class. To start off today, we're going to start talking about subsets. So sometimes uh, we want to talk about not what we can do with two different sets, uh, but how two different sets are related. And one of the ways that they can be related is that one, su uh, one set is a subset uh, of the other. So we say that a set S, uh, well, I'll say a set A, actually. A set A is a subset of a set B if every element of A uh, is also an element of B. All right, that's the definition of what it means for A to be a subset of B. Uh, the way we write that is A subset of B. Okay, that's, that's the notation we use. Uh, another way you can say this, so we have that A is a subset of B if and only if for all x, x in A implies that x in B. So this is another example that shows us uh, that sets uh, and logic are somehow very uh, intertwined. Right? They're very close together. So A is a subset of B if and only if whenever x is in A, x is also in B. That's what it means to be a subset. So we have a few results about subsets. So for any subset, or sorry, for any set S, we have two things. The first is that the empty set is a subset of S. So no matter what set S is, as long as it's a set, the empty set is a subset of that set. All right. Why would that be true? Well, we can do a little proof if we don't believe it. Um, we have to show that a is a, uh, that the empty set is a subset of S. So empty set is a subset of S. Well, that's true if and only if for all x, if oops, if x is in A. Uh, sorry, if x is in the empty set, then x is in S. Right. That's all I'm doing. I'm subbing in the empty set for A. Uh, and S for B. And now if we look at this thing, uh, when is it true that X is in the empty set? When does that happen? It doesn't happen, right? The whole definition of the empty set is that it doesn't have anything in it. So it's never true that X is in the empty set, no matter what X is. So this thing here is false for every single X. So that means the whole thing will be true for every single x. And since it's universally quantified and it's true for everything in the universe of discourse, then the statement is true. So this says the empty set is a subset of S if and only if true. And I hope you all believe that that means that it really is the case uh, that the empty set is a subset of S. Yeah? Is there any way to kind of think about this, um, not logically, but like in the, in the real world or like a concrete example, or is it just a mathematical proof? Yeah, so this, this is one way you could think of it. This one is sort of hard to, uh, hard to imagine. So. Um, I mean, so th this is like saying you're all students in 1805. Uh, if I took any zero of you, you would be a student in 1805. Uh, that's sort of vacuously true because I'm not asserting anything about anyone. 
So, I mean, of course it's true. If I don't say anything, then I'm not saying something false. Uh, so that's why we have this. This is, this is a weird thing to think about uh, in the context of the real world. The next one's hopefully a little bit more natural. I'll get to that in a second. Before I do, any other questions about this proof? This is okay? All right, so we'll move on to the second result that we have about subsets. So remember, if S is any set, then we also have that S is a subset of itself. Right, and th this is more reasonable. So if I look at the set of people in this room, it's a subset of itself. Right, because everyone who's in this room is in this room. Right, that's not a groundbreaking truth, but it is correct. Uh, and that's why this is correct. But if, if we break this down logically, we're saying S is a subset of S if and only if for all X, X in S implies X in S. And why is this always going to be true? Why is that implication true? Yeah, so to see that, you could just say, well, this is exactly the same as it is not the case that x is in s, or it is the case that x is in s. And if you want to get rid of that extra logic notation, you can just say for all x, x is not in s, or x is in s. So x is either in s, or it's not in s. There's no weird third thing that can happen. Uh, so that means this disjunction will always be true. Which means this whole thing will always be true uh, because it's universally quantified. Okay? So what this tells you is any time you have a set, you for sure know two things. You know that it's a subset of itself, and you know that the empty set is a subset of it. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right, so let's move on. Uh, we do have a little bit of extra notation, and that is if A is a subset of B and A and B are different, then we write A is a subset of B. So notice in this notation, there's not this extra little line on the bottom. You can sort of think of this as being less than or equal and this being less than. That's the same kind of, it, it's, it's an analogous difference if you like. All right, and uh, we say that A is a proper subset of B. All right, so if A is a subset of B, and A and B are not the same, then A is a proper subset of B. Right? It's just a slightly different idea, very similar. Uh, any questions about that? Is that okay? All right, so uh, now that we've talked about subsets, um, we need to talk a little bit about equality. And you'll notice when I defined proper subset, I sort of let this slip in. I said, if A does not equal B, uh, but I never said what it meant for two sets to be equal. Uh, as you might expect, two sets are equal if they contain the same elements. That shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, one thing that arises fairly frequently is that you'll be asked to prove that two sets are equal. All right, there's lots of ways to do that. I'm gonna give you one proof technique uh, that commonly works. One way that you can prove that the sets A and B are equal is to show that A is a subset of B and that B is a subset of A. Because the only way those things can simultaneously be true is if the sets are equal. This is a lot like if you had two integers, say x and y, 
If you prove that x was less than or equal to y, and that y was less than or equal to x, well, the only conclusion that you can draw is that they're equal. Question? Um, what's the difference between two sets that are equal and one set, and two sets, or one set that's uh, an improper subset of another one? So, so for example, like let's say I had that A was a subset of B. Uh, oh, sorry, you, you mean improper subset. Yeah. So an improper subset, sort of that, that would be two sets are equal. Yes, that, that would be the same thing. Although that's not really a term you'll encounter. Uh, we, we really only care about the case where it's proper. So if you're writing two subsets are equal, would you use the equal sign or would you use the greater than equal sign? Uh, you would use the equal sign. Yeah. So uh, the greater, so the analogous greater than or equal, that would be like a superset. Uh, but we don't really uh, talk about that so much in this course. Although it is defined as you would expect, it's just the opposite of this implication. It goes in the other direction. Other questions? All right, so let, let's formalize that idea for set equality. So one way to show that two sets are equal, and so I'll say it's two sets A and B are equal, is to show two things. You first show that A is a subset of B, and then you show that B is a subset of A. And if you can show both of those things, uh, they have to be the same. And this, this makes sense uh, if you go to the logic. So let's go to the logic. I want to know about A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. That's what I'd like to know about. All right, so let's write down the definitions of those things. Uh, A is a subset of B. Uh, is the same as for all x. x in A implies x in B. And the second thing is that for all x, we have x in B implies x in A. All right, those are just the definitions that we've been given. Uh, okay, the next thing you can observe is that both of these are happening uh, and they're universally quantified. So in fact, it's valid to say this. X in A implies X in B. And X in B implies X in A. So notice everything's just in one single universal quantifier now instead of two. That's valid. If you don't believe it, go back to your logical equivalences and show that it's true. And now notice what we have is x implies b and, uh, sorry, uh, x and a implies x and b and x and b implies x and a. Uh, what's that the same as? Yeah, for all x, x and a Oops. X in A, if and only if X in B. And if there's any justice in the world, uh, that means that there's exactly the same elements in the two sets. Right? That's, that's what it has to mean. There, there's no other thing that could happen. You're in A, if and only if you're in B. So that means A and B have exactly the same elements, and we know that that means that A equals B. So this says that if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, that's exactly the same. It's logically equivalent to A equals B. All right, so that's why this proof technique works. There are other ways to prove that two sets are equal. This is a handy one. What I'll say now is a very common mistake that people make. To check to see that two sets are equal, you can't just look at their size. That's not enough. Right? If you have one set of size 5 and another set of size 5, that's not enough to conclude that they're equal. You can't do that. Yep? Uh, if you have a set of size 5 and a set of size, say, 6, can you conclude that they're not equal? Right? Yes. In that case, you can conclude that they're not equal. That's fine. Uh, but you can't just look at sizes to conclude that they're equal. All right? that's, that's an important distinction. 
So a set of size 5 will never equal a set of size 6. That can't happen. But you need to make sure that you've counted the uh, elements correctly. It's very easy to miscount. Yeah? Right, so a set of size 6 that has a repeated number is really just a set of size 5. So we don't count duplicates, and that's exactly the error I was just referring to. Is if, you, if you're going to take this approach, you need to make sure that you're counting correctly. Because if you make a mistake, you will get a misleading answer. Other questions? All right. So, note, it is not enough to simply compare the sizes of the sets to prove they are equal. But, as you mentioned, it's a handy way to check to see if they're not equal, uh, as long as you're careful and count correctly. Alright, so now that we've talked about subsets and equality, we're ready to talk about the next thing about sets. So, what I'm doing right now is just sort of going through all the definitions we'll need for sets. That's why this is kind of fast. We'll get into the meat of it later. Uh, the next idea is the idea of a power set. So a power set of a set consists of the set of all subsets of A. So in general, if you have a set A, it has a bunch of subsets. We already know two of them, the empty set and A itself. There are a bunch of other ones. The power set is just all of those subsets. Right? You throw all those subsets in a set, that's your power set. So I'll do an example in case that's not clear. But before I do, I'll just define it. So the power set of a set A is the set of all subsets of A. And it's denoted uh, a couple of ways. One is sort of like a stylized P. That's what I like. Uh, other people denote it as 2 to the power A. Uh, that's okay. I don't really like that notation because it looks like you're computing a number when you're in fact you're computing a set. That seems really weird to you. Uh, bear with me for a second and I'll hopefully convince you why that notation makes sense. So let, let's do an example. Uh, let's say we have A equals 1, 2, 3. And I want to compute the power set of A. All right, so let's start doing that. Right off the top, we know that the empty set is a subset because the empty set's a subset of every set. What are the other subsets of A? Yeah. Okay, so one, two, three. What else? One, two. One, three, two, three. What else? Each number is a single set. So one, two, three. Uh, anything else? Does anyone see any other subsets here? So the answer is no. In fact, that is it. Um, all right. Does anyone have any observations about how we came up with these uh, subsets? Any thoughts about that? Yeah? So how, how did we generate this list? Yeah? Yeah, so th that's a good observation. So there were three elements in the set, and there's eight elements in the power set, and eight is two to the power of three. Uh, why would that maybe be true? Why, why does that seem like the right answer? So we don't do counting in this course anymore. You have to wait until 2804 for that. Uh, but there's, this isn't too complicated. Does anyone have any intuition for why eight is the answer? Yeah? Yeah, no, you're, 
you're, you're on the right track. You're very close. So the observation is, as you said, there's three elements. And for each one of those elements, it can either be part of the subset or not. Right? Those are the two alternatives. In this first one, so I'll do this in a different color. I'm going to write them in order. So in this one, one's not in it, two's not in it, three's not in it. In the second one, one's in it, two's in it, three's in it. In the third one, one and two are in it, but three isn't. In this one, one and three are in it. In this one, two and three are in it. And the last one, it's just one, just two, and just three. Okay, so I'm going to write these in a different order. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, uh, 1, whoops. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, uh, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Uh, does anyone know what that is? Yep. Yeah, this is counting in binary. 1, 2, oops. Not one. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So really, uh, these subsets are just binary numbers. Yeah? Uh, uh, if you have zero as true and one as false, they also correspond perfectly to the truth table if you have three numbers. So you have false, 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 false. Yes. Yeah. So in fact, the same pattern happens. And the reason is basically the same. Because if we had a truth table with three variables, we would have eight rows. And that's because for each variable, there's two truth settings, true and false. Same thing happens here. We have three things in our set. And for each one of those things, there's two alternatives. It can be in the subset or it cannot be in the subset. And this gives rise to a very efficient way of storing subsets on a computer. You can store it as a binary number with... Uh, uh, as many digits as there are elements in your set. Now, depending on sort of the conditions you're in, that may or may not be good, but it's certainly possible. So all this to say, the size of the power set of A is always equal to 2 to the power of the size of A. And this is why sometimes the power set of A is denoted 2 to the A without the cardinality bars, just 2 to the letter A. Uh, it's for this reason, to remind you that that's what the size is. All right. Any questions about this? So the kinds of things you would see on a test or an assignment would be I would give you a set and I would ask you, what is this set's power set? Or what is the size of this set's power set? Things like that. That's, that's what you can expect to see. All right, so an interesting point was brought up when we did this last example, and that was this was very similar to truth tables uh, in that the number of rows uh, was the same uh, if you had three uh, variables and three elements in your, uh, in your set when you're computing the power set. And in fact, we have a very similar notion for sets, although we do it for a different reason. And the... The idea is called membership tables. All right, so remember, just like with propositions, uh, where we combine them in different ways, uh, we can also combine sets in different ways. So we combine propositions uh, with ands, ors, nots, implies, etc. And we combine sets with union, uh, intersection, uh, difference, complement, basically. Um, when we did that with propositions, what we did was we said, okay, well, if we know the truth values of the atomic propositions, the single letters, what we'd like to do is figure out the truth value of the big compound proposition. So the analogous thing with sets is, if I know that an element is in A and in B, but not in C, for example, is it in this big set? That's the exact same kind of question. And membership tables answer those just like truth tables answered the logic version. So we can combine uh, sets in much the same way we combine propositions.
And asking if an element x is in the resulting set is just like asking if a proposition is true given these true settings. So it's a very similar idea. So let, let's do an example. Uh, I want to know what does the set A union B intersect C look like? What does that set look like? Yeah. Resulting. So what does the set A union B intersect C look like? So before we even try to ask, uh, answer that question, we should think about what it is that it's asking. So one way to interpret this would be to draw the Venn diagram. Right? That's literally answering what does it look like with a picture. And that, that makes sense. To draw a Venn diagram, we have a bunch of regions that we need to shade. Right? That's that's the Venn diagram. Uh, and really what this corresponds to is if we have some element X that's in A, in B, and in C, do I shade that corresponding region that's in all three of those sets, for example? So really drawing it is the same as deciding when elements are in the set, in the big set, given whether or not they're in the smaller set. Or smaller sets, I should say. All right. So if we have this, what we really have is three sets, A, B, and C. And let's say we have some mystery element X. X can be in A or not in A. It can be in B or not in B. It can be in C or not in C. All right. So what we do is we try all possibilities, just like in a truth table when we've tried all possibilities. All right, so there's, there's a couple alternatives here. So X, our mystery element, it could be in A or not in A. It could be in B or not in B. And it could be in C or not in C. So I've set it up exactly uh, as I did in a truth table except I'm using one to mean it's in the set and zero to mean it's not in the set. And the only reason I do this is so that you don't confuse uh, truth tables with membership tables. That's the only reason I'm using a different symbol. Conceptually, it's exactly the same thing. All right, so now very similarly to how I would set up a truth table, I break this set down. It has this part here, B intersect C, and it also has the whole thing, which is A union B intersect C. And now I start reasoning this out. So if my element X, this mystery element X, if it's in B and in C, then it will also be in the intersection of B and C, for sure, because that's the definition of intersection. If it's in B but not in C, then it won't be in the intersection, right? All right, if it's not in B, but it is in C, then it still won't be in the intersection. <laughs> and if it's in neither, then it will not, definitely not be in the intersection of those two sets. All right, and we get a, a similar sort of thing down here. It's in both B and C, so it's in the intersection, but it's not going to be in any of those. So now we've figured out when this mystery element is in B intersect C. Yeah? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
All right, so let's continue on. Now I want to take uh, this union. So this says x is in A, x is in B intersect C, so x definitely is in the union of those two things. x is in A, it's not in B intersect C, but it's in at least one of them, so it's in the union. Similarly for here, similarly for there. Here it's not in A, but it is in B intersect C, therefore it's in the union. And these last three, it's not in A, and it's not in B intersect C, so it won't be in any of these. So now we kind of know what this set looks like, although if you just looked at this diagram, that probably wouldn't be very illuminating. So what we do instead is we use this to draw a Venn diagram. And this is the real beauty of membership tables. This is how you come up with Venn diagrams. Because in general, if you just sit there looking at the formula for the set, you will not be able to draw a Venn diagram. That's too hard. It's possible. Yeah, if you're really good at it, that's fine. But it's too hard, and I don't like to do it that way. So I'll set up a Venn diagram here. This is a Venn diagram for three sets. We've only seen a Venn diagram for two sets uh, so far. The key thing is that you need all possible uh, intersections covered. So we have this set A, we have this set B, and we have the set C. And notice there's all possible overlaps. So does everyone believe that there's all possible overlaps here? So if you don't believe it for whatever reason, you can count. There's eight possibilities in this table that corresponds to being in A or not, being in B or not, being in C or not. So we can count them. Let's say this is number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right. So region number 1 is in all three. So that goes right here, right? That's in a, uh, all three of the sets. Region number two is in A, in B, but not in C. So where, where's that going to be? Right above it. It's in A, in B, but not in C. Region three is in A and C, but not B. Where's that going to be? To the left. Region 4 is in A, but not B or C. So that's going to be this. Region 5 is in B and C, but not A. So that's this right here. Region 6 is in B, but nothing else. So that's 6. Region 7 is just in C. And region 8 is in nothing which is out there. And there's no other regions. I haven't missed anything. So notice this Venn diagram. I mean, I haven't shaded it in yet, but the setup of it is exactly right. There's eight possibilities, and I have eight possibilities. Right? So th this is good. Now I just need to shade it. The way I shade it is I ask myself, when is this element going to be in the set? And it's in the set for all of these, right? It's all of the things that are one in my final column. That's when x, this mystery element, is actually going to be a part of my set. So what I do then is to shade everything that has a one in it. So here I say, well, row one, or region one, I should say, uh, has a one in it. So I had better shade region one. Region 2 has a 1 in it, so I had better shade region 2. Region 3 has a 1 in it, so I had better shade region 3. Region 4 has a 1 in it, so I had better shade region 4. Region 5 has a 1 in it, so I had better shade region 5. Region 6 does not have a 1, region 7 does not have a 1, and region 8 does not have a 1, right? That's these ones right here. 
so I don't shade those. So this Venn diagram on the right, this is exactly the Venn diagram for this set. So this is how you draw Venn diagrams. So there's questions like this on the assignment. This is how you do it. And on the assignment, notice that I ask you to explain why you're shading the regions that you're shading. This is how you explain it. You do this membership table. That's the easiest way I know how to do it. All right. You could also try to reason it out. Uh, but it's very easy to make a mistake that way. It's much better, in my opinion, and I've done a lot of these, uh, to just make the membership table. You'll get the right answer every time. It's a lot easier. And what's more, it's very easy to convince someone that you're correct. Right? It's very obvious that I'm correct here because I've only shaded five regions, and they're the ones that correspond to ones. There's three regions that aren't shaded, six, seven, and eight. Any questions about how I made this Venn diagram? Yeah. Uh, I won't ask you for four sets, it's really ugly. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, actually. We can find out, though. Let's see. There you go. So this is much easier to lose track of. Uh, how many regions are there in this? 16. Two to the four is the correct number of, uh, of regions. There's lots of different ways to draw these. Uh, here's another possibility. There's another possibility. Uh, there's not really a clean way of doing it. Um, I wouldn't ask you to do this on an assignment. It's, uh, it's too much. And certainly not on a test. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so in fact, there are very, very similar notions to logical equivalences for sets. They're called set identities. And yes, there is a distributive law that, that you could indeed do here. But we'll talk about set identities in a second. Other questions? Okay, so before I move on to set identities, um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about membership tables. Uh, and that's because membership ta whoops, wrong color. And that's because membership tables uh, can also be used to test if two sets are equal. So let's say you have three sets, A, B, and C, or two sets, A and B, or whatever, and you combine them in different ways. Uh, how do you check to see whether or not they're describing the same set? Well, just like you would check to see if two propositions are logically equivalent using truth tables, uh, you check to see if two sets are equal using membership tables. And the idea is that they're equal if they have exactly the same elements. Um, all right, so let, let's do that. I want to know, is it true that the intersection of A and B and complemented is the complement of A union the complement of B? Uh, what is this? Does anyone recognize this? It's De Morgan's law for sets. Uh, it holds just like it did for logic. So this is saying the complement of the intersection is the union of the complements. All right, so we've seen two different ways to prove that sets are equal. Okay, the first way was to show that each side is a subset of the other. So let's, let's do that first. So I want to show that each side is a subset of the other. All right, so we start with one. Let's say I want to show that uh, A intersect B is a subset of A complement union B complement. That's, that's the first thing I'll do. All right, well, notice that that's really just an implication. 
It's a universally quantified implication, but it's an implication. So let's just say X is in A intersect B uh, complement. Okay, that's, that's where I'm starting. And, and I want to show that this causes it to be in A complement union B complement. So really what I'm doing is, is I'm doing a, a universal instantiation. I'm going to infer some things and then I'm going to do universal generalization essentially. That, that's how you can think of it. So this is already instantiated. X is in A intersect B. And now we think about what that means. So that's exactly the same as saying X is not in A intersect B. Right? Because if it's in the complement, it's not in the original set. That's the definition of complement. All right. So that means, that implies that it is not the case that X is in A intersect B. Right? That's just different notation. It's not the case that it is in A intersect B. All right, well, that's the same thing as saying it is not the case that X is in A and X is in B, right? Because that's the definition of, U, uh, of intersection, sorry. All right, and notice now we have this as logic. This is pure logic. It has nothing to do with sets. This thing here is a proposition. That thing there is a proposition. So what we can say is that this is, it is not the case that X is in A, or it is not the case that X is in B. And that's by De Morgan's law for logic, right? Because I've converted the statement about sets into logic. And this is why we did all that logic stuff. It's, it's handy. All right, so now that we have that, this is exactly the same thing as saying X is not in A, or, uh, X is not in B. And if X is not in A, then X is in A complement. And if X is not in B, then X is in B complement. By definition. All right. And then the very last leap here is just looking at the definition of union. This says that X is in A complement union B complement. Am I done? So yeah, you, you would generalize. I, I'm not going to do that here. Uh, th this is good enough because this says whenever X is in uh, the complement of A intersect B, it is in A complement, union B complement. Uh, is the proof over though? No. So I've shown that, uh, I've shown this, right? I've shown that the complement of A intersect B is a subset of A complement union B complement. That doesn't show that they're equal. It just shows half of it. To complete the proof, I need to do this exact same thing, but going the other way. So this is a fair bit of work. Next, I want to show that uh, A complement union B complement is a subset of A intersect B complement. This is the next thing I have to show. So I assume that X, whoops, that X is in A complement union B complement. And now I start to think about what that implies. So this implies that X is in, uh, sorry, in, uh, uh, in A complement or X is in B complement. All right, so what does that mean? That means X is not in A, or X is not in B, right? So that's the same as saying, it is not the case that X is in A, or it is not the case that X is in B. And that's exactly the same as saying, uh, or rather it implies, uh, that it is not the case that X is in A and X is in B, right? And that's just De Morgan's law. That's exactly De Morgan's law. And now, well, if X is in A and uh, X is in B, that's the same thing as saying X is in A intersect B. 
right? And the fact that that's not true means that x is not in A intersect B. And by definition, that means it is in the complement of A intersect B. So that proves that this is true. It proves the other direction. Whoops, the other direction. Does anyone notice anything about these two proofs? Yes. Right, I'm working backwards. Uh, but I can't just say work backwards. The key thing that lets me work backwards here is that all of these arrows, all of those implies, those were actually if and only ifs, right? Because all of the things I did uh, were not if this, then this. They were this, if and only if this, if and only if this. All of these lines were equivalent to each other, okay? So if you write down just the right arrow, just the implies arrow, you have to do both parts. Because if you don't, you haven't proved both things. If you can do these steps in such a way that they hold in both directions each time, then you don't have to do both parts. Right? And at that point, you're not really proving that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, you're sort of directly proving that A equals B because they're, they're, uh, uh, an element is in A if and, only if, it's an uh, if and only if it's an element of B. Okay, That's fine. Just be clear in what you're doing. If they hold in both directions, that's fine. You can prove them equivalent like that. If they only hold in one direction for whatever reason, none of these do, but if they only hold in one direction, then you have to do both directions because the proof requires both directions. Any questions about this? Okay, so this is a lot of work. Uh, so is there an alternative? And the answer is yes, we can use membership tables. So we're going to use membership tables to prove that the complement of A intersect B is A complement union B complement. And this will be easier, hopefully. So we set up a membership table, like always. We have, whoops, we have just two uh, sets. So we only need A and B. It can be uh, in A or not, and in B or not. So there's four rows because there's two sets, just like always. And now we look at the different parts that we'll need. Right? So we'll need something for A intersect B. We'll need something for the complement of A intersect B. We'll need something for the complement of A, something for the complement of B, and then something for the union of those two complements. And the rows that we're interested in, or sorry, the columns that we're interested in rather, are this one and this one. We want to see, are those two columns equal? And if they are, then the sets are equal. Okay, so A intersect B, uh, if X is in A and B, then it's in the intersection, otherwise it's not. I take the complement of that to get that. Okay, the complement of A looks like this, the complement of B looks like that, and I take the union of those two things to get that. And indeed, these two things match. And therefore, the sets are equal. Does that make sense? Notice this is much, much faster than doing that full proof. Right? The reason you need to do that full proof is that you're not always going to be given sets in this easy to describe form. Sometimes I'll give you a set that's maybe more difficult to describe. Uh, you don't just have a formula for it. And in that case, you'll need to know the other technique. But we'll see examples of that later. All right, so moving on, just like we had logical equivalences to work with propositions, we also have something called set identities to work with sets. All right, so, uh, we're going to assume that A and B are sets. 
actually A, B, and C are sets. And they're drawn from the universe U. Okay, and this, what's going to follow is a long list of laws, just like we had uh, for propositions. So, we have the identity law. And that says that if you take any set and union it with the empty set, you get back the original set. And similarly, if you take any set and intersect it with the universe, you get back the original set. We have our idempotent law, and that is that A union A is A, and A intersect A is A. Neither of those should be too surprising. We have a domination law, just like we did, and that is that if you take any set and unit, union it with the universe, you get back the universe, because that sort of overshadows everything. And if you intersect a set with the empty set, you get the empty set. Right? Because the empty set has no elements in it, and therefore it has no overlap with A. We have something called the complementation law. And this is just like the double negation law. So if you take a set, complement it, and then complement it again, you get back the original set. That shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, moving on, we have the commutative law. And that says that A union B is exactly the same as B union A. And similarly for intersection. So A intersect B is the same as B intersect A, as usual. We have the associative law, which says you can bracket these things however you would like. So A union B union C is exactly the same as A union B union C. And similarly for intersections. So A intersect B intersect C is the same as A intersect B intersect C. Question? A un yeah, so you could apply commutativity and associativity at once. The important thing is that it's the same, uh, same operation. So if it's both complement or both union, yes, you can change the order and change the bracketing. That's fine. Okay, so after the associative law, we have the distributive law. The distributive law says that when the signs or when the operations don't match, you can distribute across them. So this is the same as A intersect B, union A intersect C, and it works if the, uh, if the things are switched. So A union B intersect C is the same as A union B intersect uh, A union C. It's very easy to lose track of when uh, which signs to flip. I like to remember it that these go together. So A union B is all in a row here. It'll be all in a row on the other side as well. That's, that's how I keep it straight. Okay, we also have an absorption law. The absorption law says that uh, A union A intersect B is just A uh, and A intersect uh, a union B is just A. That one's maybe not as obvious. Does anyone see why that's probably going to be true? You believe that it's true? You don't believe that it's true? So why, why might you not think that it was true? I mean, we, we can check. So if you don't believe that it's true, let, let's check. So we have A, B, A intersect B, and A union A intersect B. One, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. A intersect B is one, zero, zero, zero. A union A intersect B is one, one, zero, 
zero. So this and this are exactly the same. So it does hold. Uh, intuitively, why, why does it hold? Any ideas? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, you're basically on the right track. So uh, A intersect B, is that going to add any new elements to A that weren't there before? So all of the elements in A intersect B, uh, are they going to be in A? Yeah, right? A is going to be a subset uh, of A intersect B. You're only going to get rid of elements from A. Uh, and that means when you union back all of the elements of A, you're going to restore anything you got rid of. So that will give you back A. And a similar thing happens in the other case, right? You add on some elements that maybe weren't in A, but when you intersect it with A, you get rid of all of those, and that's why you end up with A. That, that's the intuition for that rule. All right, we also have the De Morgan's Law, which we've already seen. And it's the same as before. So A intersect B complement is A complement union B complement. And similarly, a union B complement is just a complement intersect B complement. This kind of law comes up very frequently. The very last law is the complement law. And that says that a union a complement is everything, and a intersect a complement is nothing. Right? These make sense because if you look at everything in A and everything not in A, well, that must be everything because there's only two alternatives. And here, A and the complement A have nothing in common. Uh, therefore, their intersection has to be the empty set. Uh, any questions about these laws? Is this okay? All right. Uh, there's one thing I haven't talked about yet. Uh, and that's uh, set difference. So just like implication, uh, it's kind of the weird one, uh, set difference is kind of the weird one. So we have a law called difference equivalence. And that is that A minus B, well, think about what that is. You take everything in A and remove the things that are in B. So you want the things that are in A, but not in B. Right? Is, is that fair to say? A minus B is in A, but not in B. Okay, so using our logic that we've learned, we want something that's in A, but not in B. And in fact, that is exactly the difference equivalence law. Okay. If you don't believe me, because this one's kind of weird, let's do a little membership table. So we have A, B, A minus B, and A intersect B complement. We never actually did a membership table for A minus B, so that, that's why this is a good idea. All right, so if something is in A and it's in B, should it be in A minus B? No. no. If something's in A and not in B, should it be in A minus B? Yes. yes. Right? Because it was in A and I didn't get rid of it because it was in B. If something's not in A and it's in B, should it be in A minus B? No. No. Right? Because when I take things away from A, nothing will magically appear. And finally, if it's not in A and not in B, well then for the exact same reasoning, it won't be in A minus B. So this is our intuitive definition uh, for how this should go. And now, so I'll, I'll add in a little column here for B complement. B complement is 0, 1, 0, 1. And now if I take A intersect B complement, that is 0, 
there, right? Because we have A intersect B complement. The next one, it's in A and in B complement, so it'll be A1. And then in the last two, it's not in A, so it definitely won't be in this intersection. So notice, this is A minus B. This is A intersect B complement. So it seems that our line of reasoning is correct. Right? Just our intuitive definition for what the set difference should be equal to is in fact what it seems to be equal to. So that's, that's kind of nice. Question? Yeah, it, it's similar to implication in that it's the weird one, uh, but it's opposite because we get this uh, we get this uh, intersection instead of uh, instead of uh, uh, union or or in that case. And the other important thing is that the thing that gets the complement uh, is on the right side, whereas an implication is the thing on the left side. Other questions? All right, so let, let's see an example of how to do this thing. All right, so let's check to see, is it true that A minus C uh, intersect B minus C is equal to A intersect B intersect C complement? So is that thing true? That's, that's what I'd like to know. And now we say to ourselves, okay, well, we have a bunch of different ways to do this. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, how to do this using a membership table and then using the identities, and then we'll be done. All right, so first let's use a membership table. We have one, two, three sets, so we'll need one, two, three columns. We fill it out the usual way. Uh, and now we, we keep track of some of these things. So we'll need something for A minus C. We'll need something for B minus C. I'll call this thing X. I'll call that thing Y. So X intersect Y. This is one important column, so I'll mark it off now. On the other side, I'll need something for A intersect B. I'll need something for C complement. And then I'll need something for A intersect B uh, intersect C complement. Okay, th those are the two things I want. So now I go ahead and uh, make these. Let me just highlight this other column too so it's clear what we're working towards. Now I just go ahead and fill in this membership table. All right. So, A minus C, uh, how do I fill that out? Well, it's in A, it's in C, so it's not in A minus C. It's in A, it's not in C, so it is there. Uh, and, then, and then what? Well, it's in A, it's not in C, so it's, uh, it's not there. Uh, it's in A, it's not in C, so it is there. And then the rest are all zeros, right? Because it's not in A for those ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, this one here, it is in A and it is in C, so it's not in the difference. Yeah. All right, so now we, we move on and do B minus C. So B minus C, it is in B, it is in C, so it's not there. It is in B, it, uh, it's, uh, it's not in C, so it is there. Uh, in both of these ones, it's not in B, so it's definitely not in the difference. And then we repeat this pattern. It is in B, it is in C, so it's not there. It's in B, but not in C, uh, so it is there. And then in the next two, it's not in B, so it's not there. All right, so now we take the intersection of these two columns to get 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay? All right. So, uh, continuing on, I want the intersection of A and B, so I get a 1, a 1, and then the rest are all zeros. The complement of C is just 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. 
And now I take the intersection of these two columns to get 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And at this point, you'll notice that these two columns match. Right? They have exactly 1, 1. It's the second from the top. So these things match. And therefore, the sets are equal. Any questions about how I did this with membership tables? This is okay? All right, so this took a, not, a somewhat considerable amount of time. I could also do it using set identities. So remember, what I'm trying to prove is that what? That A minus C intersect B minus C is equal to A intersect B intersect C complement. Okay, so the way to prove that this equality is true is you start on one side and you work your way to the other side. So I'll start on the left side with A minus C intersect B minus C. The first thing you should do is apply difference equivalence. So A minus C is the same thing as A intersect C complement. And B minus C is the same thing as B intersect C complement. That's by difference equivalence. So just like you always apply implication equivalence first, so too should you always apply difference equivalence first. Next, we notice that this is an intersection, that's an intersection, and that's an intersection. Uh, so I can move them around however I like and bracket them however I like. So I'm going to move them around like this. A intersect B intersect C complement intersect C complement. And that's by associativity and commutativity. And then what's the very last step here? Yep. Yeah, so if we look up at our list, when we complement something with itself, we get back whatever it was. Okay, so in fact we have A intersect B intersect C complement, and that's called the idempotent law. And now we're done, because that's, that's where we had to go. So th this is kind of nice, right? This is, this is a pretty easy one, uh, because it only took three lines, whereas the membership table was a lot of work. So before we go, I just want to show you that sometimes two sets are not going to be equal. That's, that's not too surprising. And I just want to show you what happens. So let's say uh, we want to know, is A minus C intersect C minus B equal to A minus B? I want to know, is that true? Uh, it's not too hard to see that it's not going to be true because we already know that it's equal to this and that's, that's not going to be the same as A minus B. Uh, but let's, let's say we didn't know that for whatever reason. So, or uh, sorry, I guess this is slightly different. This is B minus C, but that's C minus B. So, uh, yeah, don't, don't pay attention to that rationale. All right, so if we have A minus C intersect C minus B, and I didn't know that it wasn't equal to A minus B, uh, what you might try doing is going through the set identities and seeing if it is. So you just start applying them, and you get A intersect C complement intersect C intersect B complement, and that's by difference equivalence. And then after that, you might say, okay, well, I'm going to do a similar trick with the associative law. And I know that I have A minus B, so it feels like I'm going to want A intersect B complement somewhere. And in fact, I do get that. I have A intersect B complement, which is great. But the problem is I also have C intersect C complement. That's hanging around. That's by associativity and commutativity. All right, so now I have A intersect B complement, which I'll write as A minus B, which is great. That's by difference equivalence in the other direction. 
But the problem is, is I have this C intersect C complement. So the intersection of a set with its complement, that feels like it's going to be the empty set. So we go back up to our list. And indeed, we have, where did it go? Down here. Uh, a set intersected with its complement is the empty set. So we have that this thing is equal to A minus B intersect the empty set. And what was that rule called? It was called the complement law. Let's buy the complement law. Uh, and now I want to know some set intersected with the empty set. That feels like it's going to be the empty set because they shouldn't have anything in common. But we're new at this, so let's go check our list. And over here, we have the domination law. You take a set, intersect it with the empty set, you get the empty set. So this thing here is equal to the empty set, and that's by the domination law. So what we were trying to do was prove that A minus C intersects C minus B was equal to A minus B, but we accidentally proved that it's equal to the empty set. So now we have to ask ourselves, is the empty set the same thing as A minus B? No, right? It's, it's not. And to do that, well, if this were uh, logic and we were working with propositions, what you would do is you would put in truth values to show that you get some value here, but a different value here, so they're not equal. What you would do for sets is give examples of sets, right? So. If we let A be equal to the set, say, 1, 2, and B equal to the set 1, well then A minus B is equal to 1, 2 minus 1, which is just 2. And that's definitely not the same as the empty set. And I know that it's not the same because one has size 1 and the other has size 0. Question? Right, so it'll always be fairly straightforward like this. Uh, however, on a test, I encourage you to go to the membership table route uh, because that was sort of guaranteed to work in a fixed amount of time. So the other thing you can do here is make a membership table for both of these things. And if the columns don't match, uh, then they're not equal. Yeah? Right, so all of these statements, it's, a, it's as if you're saying for any sets A, B, and C, or for any sets A and B. So the fact that there's a single set, or several sets for which it doesn't work, means that it's not true. Any other questions? All right, so that's actually all I have to say about sets. Next class, we'll move on to functions. Uh, for those who don't know, I have posted the assignment, uh, the next one, so do take a look at it. Uh, and that's it for tonight.